11 people turned in their essay. Nice, that's good. So uh, just a pretty flexible guy, but after the exam, I don't take anything. And that is simply because people are still saying, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. It's like, no, no one gives me anything after the exam. So if you're one of the 11 who turned it in now, awesome. Otherwise, I don't take anything after 3.30 on Thursday, okay? So that's, that's uh, uh, a rule developed over years of wasting my time waiting. So uh, Thursday at 3.30 to 5.30, the exam's in here. I'll probably be here a little bit early, but I may, you know, no one else will be opening up the room or anything as they usually do, so I'll try to get here a little earlier today. But if we arrive earlier, we can start, or we have to... I don't mind if letting you start if you oh, arrive earlier. Yeah, because yeah. I have a 410, I have the other one. Oh, yeah, yeah, and okay. it's kind of like, oh my god. Yeah, Yeah. So okay. we can arrive like, I don't know. I, I can't promise you anything because, once again, my job is to be here at that time, yeah. and I will be. But I will try to be here early. Okay, well, I'll, I will. And open the room and such. Hopefully that will work. Um, I'm just showing you the resources and stuff for where the review material is. So final exam review there in modules. I see people have been playing the cahoots already, so that's good. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, really helps. So, well, that's good because there's, you know, like, there's a lot of detail in this class, isn't there? Crazy. All right, so um, everybody has to come in to write it. It's not available online. There are 50 questions on the exam. There are multiple choice or true false. They're from chapters 8 through 13 of the textbook, so there's a Kahoot for each of those. Uh, with minor changes, questions will be repeated from the quiz that we took. So the quiz that covered chapters 8 and 10, and that will also be reflected in the Kahoots. So. Um, the best way to prepare for the exam is to review the PowerPoint presentations shown in class, but especially play the cahoots. Um, so, everyone doing okay with cahoots by now? I would think, okay. So they close at noon on Thursday. So use them before then, because they won't be open right up until the last moment. And there's a link with instructions, and then here are the links to each of the individual cohoots. Um, if you like getting a list of topics as well, there they are. So the, <clears throat> in terms of content, what they are, let us, uh, let's play the cahoots. If you guys don't mind, um, we need at least one person playing. <laughs> so this is chapter eight, loading up. And uh, chapter eight is about What's it about? Audience measurement. Ooh, one of my favorites. Okay, chapter 8. Let's play class. Okay, questions about Chapter 8. Nielsen's audiometer was first used to measure which of the following? Radio stations, TV viewers, TV viewers, both radio and TV. We got a lot to cover. So yes, two people got it right. Radio station listeners in the 1930s. The audiometer was their first uh, product, basically. DMA stands for, this is ratings language, designated market area, dominant media area, dynamic media advertising, or digital marketing association. Okay, we got two answers, that's good. Yes, designated market area. So the DMA, for instance, the San Francisco Bay Area is a DMA, one of the biggest in the country. Okay, all right. In a one million television household area, COPS is seen in 150,000 homes. We got two answers yet? Come on, somebody answered. I did. Okay, one person answered. Two answers, yes. So the correct answer is 15, incorrect answer 1,500. So let's review how ratings and share are calculated, okay? So rating and share, two ways of measuring what starts off with the same number of households uh, actually watching a program. So let's say we've got 150,000 
households watching a program. And we're looking at that over 1 million households that could be watching TV. So sometimes that's called the universe. Whatever we call it, it is the total number of households in the DMA, in the market. Okay? So what we're looking at is this divided by this times 100 because it's a percentage. And that would come out to, it's 15%, or 15 is the answer there. Now, if we were looking at share, we would for instance, start off with the same number of households that watch, TV, watch the show. So they watch show, right? But instead of calculating it over the universe, we calculate it over the actual number of households that are a tune in that night. So, you know, given any week, your universe is going to be larger than the number of, you know, households that, that tune in. So let's say only half the number of households in the universe actually have the TVs on at the time that, you know, the show that you're watching actually goes on. So at this point, you're dividing 150,000 into 500,000, and easy math here, but the share would wind up being 30 instead of 15. Because these are the, this, we're only counting the number of households that actually had their TVs on. And that will always be smaller than the universe, which is just everybody in the market, right? On any given night, not everybody in the market will be watching TV. They'll be doing something else. So rating is over the universe, share is over just the TV, you know, the number of households that had TV on. Questions about that? Just a quick review on that. All right, so the correct answer there would be 15, and we were, of course, calculating ratings. You know, in order for us to be calculating share, this would have to say, it was seen in 150,000 homes, but only, you know, 500,000 had their TV on. And then I'd say, what is the share? You know, so you need to know the difference between rating and share. It's a different calculation. All right, let's move on. We've got a lot to deal with. Radio station ratings often measures audiences in terms of what? So because people in radio tend to you know, surf off somewhere else and come back and surf off and come back. They do an average rating, the average quarter hour. So three people got that right. So the answer is average quarter hour. Because people move around the dial so much, they average it out over 15 minutes. If a spot advertisement costs $100 and reaches 1,000 people, what is its CPM? So remember, CPM stands for cost per mill, the cost that it takes to reach 1,000 people. CPM equals cost per 1,000 listeners or viewers or whatever. So the correct answer was number two. It was 100 bucks, OK? If CPM can be defined as the cost to reach 1,000 people, then in this case, we told you it cost 100 bucks to reach those 1,000 people. So the CPM is $100. When Ford pays for half of a local car dealer's advertising, it is known as? So this is a type of advertisement where the national distributor shares the cost with the local outlet, you know, distributor or whatever. So they share it together. So this would be known as, we're going to go right away, into cooperative advertising, OK? So Ford cooperates with the local car dealer in order to pay for the ad. So that makes it interesting for the local car dealer because Ford pays for half of it. OK, Nielsen's PPM. What is a PPM? Personalized portable metric, a portable people meter, a point of use personal meter, a peck of pickled peppers, or a personal portable meter. All right, very good. Everybody got it. A portable Peter people, Peter, Peter, 
a little thing about this big that picks up codes that uh, are embedded into radio and television shows. Not to distract you, but I just read an article uh, pointing out that Alexa and Google Home can also hear these types of codes that you cannot hear. So watch out for devices in your household that can dog whistle information into that type of device. Okay, question eight out of 15. Diary responses can be inaccurate, but ratings based on metering devices fix those problems. So in the history of ratings, we started off people phoning you up, and then you had a diary to fill in. And then the claim here is that the PPM, the metering device, fixes any problems. But of course, that's false. You can still have problems like not having an adequate representation of every demographic group from your population in your sample, for instance, because they don't want to participate. So you still have inaccuracies and errors even using the PPM. In addition, the PPM may just pick up sound that you don't even care about. Ad exchanges are most common in which medium? So an ad exchange is a group of some type of media outlet that gets together and they form an exchange that sells advertising for the group. And it is right on the internet. So this is the way that multiple little blogs can team up together and have an ad exchange sell their advertising for them. The ad exchange, through using multiple blogs as outlets, gets a huge audience eventually. So it's good for both of them. During four times a year in television measurement, during November, February, May, and July, Nielsen sends diaries to samples across the country. What do they call that, sample homes? That is awesome, the sweeps period. And by the way, this week, uh, the upfronts are happening in New York. If you want to just look at Variety or any of the other industry trades, you will see that's the most busy time of year. They're reporting on what are the new shows coming out in the fall. Meanwhile, all the networks are selling their television advertising right now. Usually they come in at around $8 billion of sales or promised sales in the next couple of weeks. So uh, you'll see they're all in New York. I think Fox went Monday and NBC also went Monday. So they, they take turns putting on these huge shows. Okay, ratings explain why viewers and listeners prefer certain programs over others. Can ratings explain to us why somebody likes a show. Correct, that is false. Ratings can tell us how many people tune in, but not why. We have to do different research for that. Question 12, barring an unlikely event, shares are always larger than ratings. So share in this case was larger than ratings, right? Okay, we'll skip through. It is true, actually, because again, you may have a million homes in your universe, and your DMA is like could, a million homes could be watching, but on any given night, not, not a million will be tuned in. It'll be less, which means that your denominator gets smaller. That means your result will be bigger. So shares are always bigger than uh, ratings. Which of these is an actual audience measurement challenge faced by online advertisers? So there are different companies using different metering techniques online. Uh, they choose samples differently. Some of them recruit the way television does. Some of them get their sample through uh, buying access on laptops and stuff. And what's happening down here? Different ways of counting. How come we can't? There we go. Different ways of counting website visitors. That's another way. OK, so boom. All of the above, those are all challenges faced by online advertisers. And next up, which of the following is used to set online advertising rates? Another big one. Let's see, someone jump in there. Thank you, great. And so it is hits, cost per click, and cost per transaction. Even go into that, everyone got it right, excellent, good for you. Audience activity is more important than audience size in mobile or social media ad campaigns. Okay, boom, off we go. Absolutely. Engagement trumps size in that part of the business. All right, cool. 
Good for Nat. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. So now we're going to head over to chapter nine. And before we jump in there, let's find out exactly what was in chapter nine. Oh, the social media. This one is a this one is an easy chapter. As we old folks don't know much about social media, you guys know a lot about it. So we ask pretty dumb questions about it. And here's the new pin. Which service is considered to have broken the ground for the social networking sites of today? This is a classic question. And we got one answer out there for Friendster. Very good, Friendster was it. And we move along. Blogs can be considered watchdogs of both the government and the media. True or false? Awesome, everyone got it. True, for sure. Um, okay, we'll just continue promise not to elaborate on anything gets a perfect score. Which of the following describes Facebook? All right, excellent. A social network designed to connect to college students. Very good. Which of the following best describes Instagram? Two answers, excellent. A place to store visuals. Notice there are two correct answers on this one. It is a social network. It's also a place which is primarily visuals, very visual stories. Yes? Microblog. Um, I don't know. Textbook doesn't say it is. <laughs> okay. And off we go. Which of the following best describes Twitter? Ah, ah. There we go. So that's the one that the textbook wants us to know is a microblogging site. Right. And another option, an open access network, since you don't yeah, have to give your actual internet, open access. Both of those would have been acceptable. All right, and we move on. Something collects pages of images reflecting a mood or vision called a self-expression engine. Yes, indeed, Pinterest, nice. And we continue. Something is a social network most associated with career and job information. Sweet, everybody gets LinkedIn. Something is known for impermanent posting that disappears fast. I told you we asked silly questions. There we go. Snapchat, nice. Which platform is primarily issue oriented where ideas are shared, not photos and likes? Second answer, second answer. Okay, blogs is the right answer, okay? Blogs. <laughs> and next up, something occurs when the ordinary person on the street using social media observes and reports. Nice, citizen journalism. Excellent, we'll continue. Being loosely yet incessantly connected to each other with others via social Arts. networks is called? Great. And yes, ambient awareness. So it means you're always kind of aware of what your friends are sort of doing. Okay. What's not true about internet privacy? Digital communications make government surveillance easier. Sounds reasonable to me. Users feel in control of their data on social media sites, do you? If you post stuff online, it may stay there forever. Apple refused to unlock the phone of San Bernardino terrorists. So which one of those seems the least true? Oh, come on, what happened? Not true. I think you guys were going for the true ones, but you're supposed to go for the not true one. So the not true one, users feel in control of their data on social media sites. Yay, SS, congratulations. And we will move on. <coughs> our whirlwind review to chapter 10. Chapter 10 regarding the media business, where we talk about toll broadcasting, media consolidations, station and network compensation agreements. Oh yeah, uh, that one, that's an interesting one. Remember, uh, uh, compensation agreements, is, we're talking about the relationship between local stations and television networks. So remember, early on in the history of broadcasting, the television network used to pay its affiliates. It would say, oh, thank you for being an NBC affiliate. Here's a check every month. But with the rising cost of network programming, like sports and stuff, things have reversed. So there's something called reverse compensation now, where the local station actually has to pay the network. Because the network says, we paid billions of dollars for this sports you know, licensing that we did, you got to pay us. So that's reverse compensation. You know, the old way was they paid the, the network, paid the station. Now the station has to pay the network. 
okay. And then other stuff about libel and slander, ownership and operation, so who can own a station, etc. So let's take a look at this, chapter 10, the media business. Oh, we got two, so we'll jump in and start. Anyone else wants to join, feel free. Here we are, uh, chapter 10. The 1941 report on chain broadcasting led to the creation of ABC. True or false? Oh, nice. It is true, okay? Uh, the chain broadcasting report said that uh, NBC had too much power, and so they were required to get rid of part of their network. They did, and that became ABC. Question two, the FCC will not grant a license to a convicted felon. If you're a felon, that's correct, okay? You cannot get a television station if you're a convicted felon. Question three, a 30 minute infomercial for a skincare system is an example of what revenue model? Is it sponsorship? Is it subscription based? Toll broadcasting? I think that's all that's actually participating. Okay, okay. Two for toll broadcasting, which was correct, and two for spot advertising. So that's incorrect. So let's explain what's going on here. Sponsorship, that's where <coughs> one company sponsors the entire show. That's pretty rare now, but historically they used to do that. Uh, Subscription-based, so you would find that in cable broadcasting where, you know, you pay money to HBO and they take that money and produce shows. That's a different revenue model, subscription. Now, spot advertising is where you got a bunch of 30 second commercial spots and that supports the program. So that is not correct because what we're talking about here is a 30 minute infomercial, just one huge long commercial basically. And that is a great example of toll broadcasting, which from very early on in the broadcasting industry history was, you know, a, a client could purchase a block of time on the air and put what they want on there. So your 30 second spots are just little things, but if you purchase a block, that's toll broadcast. So it's still happening uh, late at night on some channels. Okay, oldie program, the Craft Music Hall is an example of what kind of business model? And we did, four people said sponsorship, correct. Because Craft sponsors the entire thing. Okay, let's go. Paying a monthly fee to access Netflix online is an example of what kind of business subscription? Okay, we got three and four. Everybody got it right. It is subscription. Great. And question six. Which of the following is not a component of the broadcast star model? So remember the broadcast star? So which of these just doesn't relate to broadcast? Yes, everybody got it. Good. I don't have to explain the broadcast star model. So the FTC is the Federal Trade Commission, not a government agency that it is all that is all that involved in day-to-day -day operations in media or something. They'll get involved in a huge merger. But these are all parts of broadcasting. Everybody got it right. Great. Which of the following would disqualify someone from owning a broadcast station apart from being a convicted felon? So what else would bar you from doing it? And three people got it right, not being a US citizen. So Rupert Murdoch, founder of the Fox Broadcasting Network, which will be sold to Disney, uh, is a, uh, became a US citizen in order to be the head of that network. How did he do? Did he get married? I don't think so. <laughs> he just bought his way in. Good lawyers. <laughs> Something refers to a station being owned by one company, but operated by another. Boring. Okay, one is the correct answer. A local marketing agreement. So uh, don't be fooled by cross ownership. What this situation describes is there are limits as to uh, how many television stations you can own in a single market. You may nonetheless, you know, want to be able to control two stations. So you could have, you could own and operate a station in a market, and you could also have a local marketing agreement with another station and basically run it, even though it is uh, actually owned by somebody else. This to respect the FCC ownership rules. So that is a local marketing agreement when one company owns the station, but it is operated by another. 
Making cable companies pay local TV stations for the right to include the local TV signals is called <coughs> rights. This means that Comcast, for instance, has to pay some money to a local station. So that is retransmission consent. Hmm, nobody got that. Okay. So um, must carry is the rule that forces Comcast to carry that station. However, Comcast has to carry the station, but it uh, can elect, the station itself can elect either to make a retransmission consent agreement, which is, says, so look at it this way I'm Comcast. I'm required to carry that station, unless the station says, no, we don't want you. Uh, the station can always say, no, we don't want you. So it has to enter into a retransmission agreement with Comcast. Anyway, retransmission consent. Next up, something refers to a single entity owning more than two radio stations in a market. All right, so the correct answer was duopoly. Okay, so monopoly means that you are the one and only owner, you own on one thing. Duopoly is when you're allowed to own two things in a market. Okay, next one. Owner consolidation led to a media market that is increasingly what? So there used to be a whole bunch of you know small radio stations, mom and pop, and now all of a sudden through consolidation, there are only a few big players. Good. Oligopolistic. So you know, a mono, if it was monopolistic, that means only one company would own everything. But oligopolistic means a limited number of companies own everything, like the oligarchs in Russia. So there are a few of them. Okay, let's go. Which of the following is increasingly being used to select broadcast licensees? So the FCC has a very limited number of licenses it can give out because a lot of frequencies are filled up. How do they do it? How do they choose who to give it to? All right, we're going to jump. Let's jump. The correct answer is auction. They auction it off, making money for the government. Yes? Do you know how long they've been doing that? Ooh. Um, since the beginning of cellular, so that must be in the late 90s, I would say. Yeah, this is just based off of, you know, personal awareness. We could look it up, but yeah. Okay. It is, yeah, there was, you know, for instance, when they sold off the first 2G frequencies, they made like literally billions of dollars doing that, you know, and then companies were having a hard time turning a profit, but now they're great. They've made a lot of money. Which, of course, is not necessarily what we want, but the government made a lot of money auctioning. Okay, this type of defamation occurs when the offending statement is spoken. So uh, we covered a little bit about uh, libel and slander. So this is where, you know, your station could get sued in deep, deep trouble if you say something untrue about somebody um, or if you write something untrue about them. So slander, when you say something about them on air, you could, uh, could, could potentially get you know, sued for slander and lose, all right? So this is, of course, if they can prove that you uh, purposefully set out to defame somebody using false information and you knew that it was false at the time and so on and so forth. The bar is rather high to win that. The rule that local cable providers include all over-the-air TV channels in its TV basic lineup. So this is the, the situation. Comcast must carry those stations. So what do we call that? <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but we had, I, 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 I'm justified in, so it is actually must carry. Okay, so it is must carry. So this question refers to the rule that the cable carrier has to put everything in their basic lineup. So that is called must carry. Now remember, the retransmission consent comes a little bit afterwards where Comcast says, well, I'm supposed to carry your thing. Do you want me to carry you? And they say, sure, but you got to pay us. And at that point, that's retransmission consent, which CBS did to Time Warner. Time Warner said, we don't want to pay you. 
And CBS said, okay, don't take our shows and don't take any showtime and don't take anything else that we own. And within a couple of weeks, you know, Time Warner said, okay, okay, we'll pay you, we'll pay you because everyone was complaining. All right, to defend against libel, broadcaster can demonstrate that the defamatory statements are true. So is that a true assertion? It is, absolutely, right? So you can win that lawsuit if you can prove that what you were saying is actually true. All right, good job. And so uh, we don't need to get results. We need to close this, leave this site. And so what were we on there? Uh, let's just have a quick look. That was the media business. Now we're going to get into station operations. This has to referring to in a television or radio station, who does what? So let's head into chapter 11. Play this kahoot, classic. Okay, while you guys are, uh, where's the pin? There's the pin. One player, two players, and we start. <clears throat> Just want to check now. I don't have time to check. All right, we're on our way. Streaming content to your computer takes less file space than downloading it. Is that true or false? So if you stream content, that is true. That's right. If you, if you download content into your computer, as you do in podcasts or to your cell phone, it takes space. Streaming does not. All right, and we move along. Newsrooms using new technologies typically increase the size of their field production crews. True or false? Well, that one is false. So let's think about that for a second, the 50-50 split. So um, certain technologies like robotic cameras in television studios have basically done away with all the camera operators and most of the people who would work on the floor in a television studio. Everything is automated in the control room. Uh, one person now programs all of the events that happen in the switcher. Uh, audio events, video events, switching from one camera to another, all that is programmed in in advance, and one operator just sits there triggering each event that comes up. So in both those cases, what we see is expensive people with jobs are eliminated for relatively cheap technology that comes in and changes everything. So. Uh, it is, it is false that getting new technologies means that you have to grow your crew. It's, on the contrary, it usually is done to make your crew smaller. Studio cameras are mounted on something, and it's not a tripod, so what is it? Very good. They're called pedestals, like Roman gods. This computerized device combines and processes signals from multiple video sources, different cameras, Go in there, absolutely. The switcher is what that's called. It used to be you switch between one camera and another. I still do. Radio promotions are designed to generate controversy so people will talk about the station. False, absolutely right. Media companies do not want controversy. They do not want to alienate their viewers. So promotions are... Definitely they want you to talk about it, but not because it's controversial. One advantage that terrestrial radio continues to have over satellite and streaming is localism. So terrestrial radio originates in your community. True, absolutely. Satellite or streaming come from nowhere. Okay, who's in charge of policy, hiring, payroll, contracts, and facilities at a local station? Is it the engineers, the general management, the program director, or the production department? Nice, the general management. So just like any other business, managers deal with policy, hiring, payroll, contracts, and all the rest of it. Which of the following works most closely with the music director? So, promotions, the chief engineer, program director, absolutely. So the program director is responsible for everything that goes out over the air on a radio station. And a music director would be subordinate to the program director. The music director chooses the music that goes up there. Okay? Program director would also be, for instance, hiring different on-air personalities, stuff like that. So anything you hear, you know, they would be booking different you know, promotional packages and stuff. So anyway, 
departments. The engineering department of a local station is also responsible for FCC technical compliance. True, excellent. So a big part of the broadcast engineer's job is making sure that they respect the technical conditions of the license, that they're broadcasting at the right power so that they don't overwhelm another business in another market, for instance. The system for distributing cable TV to subscribers resembles a tree with trunk and branches. Okay, absolutely, that's right, it does. And next up, the type of wires used by cable systems do not lose strength when traveling long distances. True or false? False, absolutely. The reason you can't get super fast power uh, internet connections through your cable TV is that it does lose power over distance. Okay, next up. Buying time on other media to publicize a broadcast station involves which department? So this is the department that publicizes your own station. Promotions, absolutely, right. And whoops, why do I keep right clicking? Okay, TV programming departments are primarily concerned with program production, program acquisition and scheduling, hiring of staff, or content censorship. That be excellent program acquisition and scheduling. Okay, they don't produce it, they just buy it and put it on at the right time. That's good. In larger markets, the sales manager position may be divided into local sales manager and regional sales manager. How come that doesn't show up there? <laughs> Sorry, I just gave you the answer. That's why it doesn't come up there. Uh, Cahoots. All right, well, boom, there we go. Hey, I got it right. Regional or national sales manager. Okay, next up. And we're done. All right, way to go, Nat. Okay. <laughs> I believe. And we are moving on to motion picture industries. Okay, so this one, I was thinking about this uh, because I think about exam reviews all the time. I realize we didn't actually play this Kahoot yet. So for some of you, this would be the first time we've played it. Okay, after the 2007 writer's strike, studios bought fewer original scripts and more existing IP. IP stands for uh, intellectual property, like comic books, for instance. Okay, that is correct. So the 2007 writer's strike was a big deal for Hollywood. Uh, it uh, really made studios, the major studios, much less interested in investing in, let's say, original content, you know, like the, the, uh, the, um, the original stories that scriptwriters would come up with, much more interested in just licensing existing properties. Uh, they find that it's a lot more economically efficient to do it that way now. Just go ahead and license or buy something that everyone is aware of rather than investing in, you know, some original material that no one knows about yet. Okay. All right. Question two. The film industry underrepresents women and minorities in executive and creative roles. Very true. Hopefully it'll change. Okay. Next up. In the 1930s, the motion picture industry began to be regulated by... Was it the Motion Picture Production Code, the Doctrine of Responsible Film Production, the Code of Film Ethics, or the Code of Good Practice? Okay, well, a answer is this one. This is just purely like biology. Remember the fact of the name of whatever. It's the Motion Picture Production Code, MPPC, also known as the Hayes Code because the guy who was originally in charge was, his name was Hayes. All right. The Hayes Code did not explicitly prohibit something. What was it? So did they, okay. Question is, yes. All right, so here we go. The, the Hayes Code said you cannot show people having sex, you cannot show mixed race romances. Pretty sick time of our 
history, you cannot have foul language, but it's okay to show extreme violence. <laughs> that was the Hayes code. They, so they did not say, I know. There you go. That was the country in the 1930s. Innovations such as widescreen were introduced in response to poor attendance at movie theaters. So, you know, they were worried because television was coming in. So the 1950s, they started putting widescreen. Yes, correct. In the 1950s, the Hollywood studios became complicit in blacklisting, but who did they blacklist? Absolutely right, suspected communists. That was the Red Scare. Shooting films outside LA to lower labor costs. What is that called? Shop hopping, free rider production, runaway production. Okay, runaway production is correct. Shop hopping is not. So let me, I'll fix that for you. But it's, run, it's called runaway production because it runs away from Hollywood and it goes to Toronto or Vancouver because things are cheaper there. That's called runaway production. Okay, and next up, what was Hollywood's best year of the golden era? Year of the Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, so on and so forth. Yes, 1939, considered Hollywood's greatest year. Movie studio executives now tend to come from what type of activity? Are they from the Directors Guild? Are they from sales and marketing divisions? Are they from screen actors or the ranks of Hollywood producers? Sales and marketing is correct, okay? So uh, movie industry executives tend to be people who know how to sell movies. That's the most important thing. You don't have to be creative. You don't have to be a good producer or an actor or anything. You just know how to sell something. So they're from sales and marketing. Question 10, in contemporary Hollywood, branding tends to be about, so a studio, you know, uh, what, are they trying to, what are they trying to do? Telling uplifting stories about Wall Street. Doing one type of movie? Okay, absolutely. So big studios set out to try to create franchises like the Marvel Universe, right? Okay, Marvel Universe would be a great example of that. All right, so much for the movie business, and we'll leave it. And I think we have two more coming up. Oh no, we got one more coming up. Yay, social research. Okay, so this is one of the trickier ones, but let's get into it. So dealing with strong effects, so yeah. strong effects including the magic bullet or propaganda theory. Okay, well let's, let's play this. One more. Chapter 13, we play. All right, we got two players. Feel free to join in as we're going on, folks. Chapter 13. Some believe the government should regulate media content. Others believe that viewers should regulate that content. Is that true or false? <laughs> true, absolutely. There's this whole difference of ideological perception of this issue you know uh, liberals tend to want the government to do it and conservatives tend to want individual viewers to have that some content not intended for children may be broadcast without penalty during the safe harbor which remember runs from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. the rules about content are slightly different that's correct you can show indecent language or you can, well, you can, yeah, whatever. Indecent language or imagery can be shown between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. That's the safe harbor, yeah. Because the kids are in bed. Okay. Pro-social media effects have positive results, like kids getting higher academic achievement. They get better scores or something like that. Absolutely, that is true. I hope somebody wrote about pro-social media effects in their final essay. Question 4 of 11. Obscenity restrictions in broadcasting are rooted in the Miller versus California court decision. That is true. That's right. That's an essential decision. Okay, next up. Which of these is most closely related to Albert Bandura's Bobo doll experiments? Remember where they showed kids 
videos or films of other kids beating up dolls and then they turn them in a room and the kids beat up the dolls. Modeling, that's called modeling, where the kid models the behavior that they see on TV. Which of these is most closely related to the belief that media have limited effects? So the chapter breaks down media effects into strong effects and then also limited effects. So one person, okay, so the magic bullet is a strong effect. This is the idea that the media message basically enters your brain like a bullet and makes you do, you know, oh, I got that idea, I gotta go buy that. Ah. The limited effect says that, yeah, the media has some effect, but also, you know, those opinion leaders that uh, get in the middle and create a second step in the flow of the message, um, they count for something too. So that's where we say, yeah, the media message has a limited effect in this case. The magic bullet or propaganda theory, that's a strong effect. That says, yeah, the message just makes you do something. You know? The limited effect says, yeah, it has a limited impact. It takes a social opinion leader to get in there to make it worthwhile as well. Cultivation is an example of what type of media effect? Is it behavioral, quantitative, affective, or cognitive? The correct answer is cognitive effect. So remember cultivation theory from George Gerbner is the theory of media effects, which says that if you watch a lot of television and see a lot of murders on TV, you start to think that's where the cognition comes in. You start to think that the world is a meaner place. The mean world syndrome is that the more TV you watch, the more you are afraid that someone will come and do violence to you. So it's a thinking effect. It's cognitive type of effect. Because watching TV impacts the way you think about the world. Question eight, which theory says that people who view a lot of television <laughs> view the world as a mean place? Whoops. Well, why not? <laughs> gotcha. Cultivation theory. That's good. People are listening. I like that. Thank you. OK, next up. The ability of news media to focus our attention and concern on certain issues is known as what? Agenda setting. Agenda setting? I hear agenda setting, that is correct, yes? So agenda setting theory says the media doesn't tell you what to think. That would be a strong effect. That would be the magic bullet. But the media tells us what's important, what we should think about, not necessarily what we think. And so, yeah, they set the agenda for what's important. The news, for instance, does that. Which perspective assumes that individuals select media and content with specific purposes? Okay, excellent. Uses and gratifications theory, right? So the magic bullet theory, that's a strong media effect. Message goes in your head, you do it. Modeling theory, that's, a, that's where the kids, you know, got to the, looks at the other kid beating up a Bobo doll and then they go beat up a Bobo doll, right? The two-step flow, a limited effect. That's where the media message has some impact, but it requires social opinion leaders to get in the middle of it and say, hey, did you hear about you know, the latest? But uses and gratifications most resembles our intuitive understanding of what we do with media. We consume media because we want to. We want to use it. It gives us certain gratifications. It does stuff for us. So we have our specific purposes that are served by our media use. Last one, tendency to remember messages that have the most meaning for us is most closely associated with. So media research takes a look at a whole group of people and it finds out that they tend to remember the stuff that they already agree with. So that is called selective something. Selective retention is the correct answer, okay? So retention, the, the question asks, what do we remember best? So the idea is that we will selectively retain the information that we agree with. Uh, stuff that we disagree with, it's harder to remember. Uh, selective exposure means that we avoid programs that have information that we don't agree with. 
Selective acceptance means that we won't accept what we hear when we hear it. Selective perception means that we will not perceive as well stuff that we disagree with. Uh, so retention and remembering go together in this case. So that's, that's that one, selective retention. OK, we won't complicate it with any more um, blah, blah, blah than that. OK, I believe those are all of our cahoots. Any questions about um, what we've been looking at? Anything that we should look at? Again. Uh, so you notice there are a few things in these lists, like for instance, was there a question about pro-social viewing? I mean, there was somewhere in there, but maybe not in the chapter 13 stack. But you know, so you know that pro-social pro viewing could have a positive effect. Um, yeah, so you know, probably a good thing to do in addition to playing the cahoots is just looking this over and saying, do I remember what the mean world theory is? Does, you know, do I remember what the Bobo doll theory was? So try it both ways. You'll get the correct answers and a, a sense of the question from the Kahoot, but also run through that. And you know, you could, if you are really going to go wild on this, you could go into the PowerPoints and take a look there. Okay. Do you remember ratings and share the difference of and how to calculate? Okay, I'll try to get here earlier on Thursday. Otherwise, I'll see you Thursday. Good luck. And again, if you didn't turn in your essay already, remember, I absolutely never touch anything after the final exam. So the window is narrowing. <laughs>